So I now call on Professor Siri to discuss uh, the uh, final paper, please. some of the features in consciousness which are discussed widely and is still uh, scientists are discussing, especially neuroscientists. Uh, if somebody says that whether uh, consciousness, I mean quantum physics cannot describe consciousness, this is too general statement and it's very difficult for a hardcore scientist for me to comment anything on that. But he pinpointed some of the core features he called and uh, I, I will try to discuss or make some comments and uh, critical analysis from the neuroscientific perspective. Uh, I, I used to sit uh, in a, a room in the United States uh, in a university where my uh, next room was occupied by famous uh, brain research scientist, he is called Pibram. Every week he used to come to my office and he asked, she should tell me where is my mind. So uh, I was really confused, where is, it, where is mind? And as a scientist, we should start from something in the labs. Like if you are uh, doing something on material things, you need to start with atoms, molecules, bigger and bigger chunks and their properties. So in this case, uh, our main approach is like to start with brain and brain consists of billions of neurons, so start with uh, neuronal activities and then try to understand the core features of the consciousness. Because in general consciousness, I, I, I will not be able to tell about the general consciousness, but some core properties. So one of the properties, uh, uh, Geshe-la, he talked about subjectivity. So subjectivity, we mean uh, the subjective experience, like qualia redness of a flower or love. So the issue to hold or to challenge to hold neuroscientific community is that whether the laws of science, which is laws of physics, can explain the subjective experience or qualia and all other things which we call uh, consciousness, other, other aspects of consciousness like uh, where it is located or kind of reflexivity are coming later on, but the main challenge to neuroscientists of today's world, whether laws of physics can explain the qualia or subjective experience. And the present status is that we really are not able to say anything concretely on that aspect. So if someday, maybe tomorrow or day after, if people can say, well, we can understand the subjective experience of qualia in terms of laws of physics, then I think the problem to the scientist will not no more be there. But if we cannot really understand, then maybe we need new paradigm, new paradigm than quantum paradigm itself. And second one, uh, again, I mean, I, I have a uh, question to my Buddhist colleague that according to modern, I mean major school of neuroscientists headed by uh, Rudolf Holinas, he is the father of modern neuroscience in New York Medical School. Uh, he told that we are trying to understand subjective experience like qualia in terms of the neuronal activity or what he called central nervous systems. So if there exists central nervous systems to any entity or any animals, then he, he, it, or he or she, whatever, should have subjective experience of qualia. But we don't know, we are not able to prove it right now, whether 
Buddhist scripture can say anything, then even other than human beings, they might have also subjective experience of polya. We, we don't know the answer, but according to our, our proposal of the neuroscientist, that uh, the animals or entities, whoever have nervous system, they should have a polya. And uh, from the morning also, His Holiness was uh, saying very uh, deeper things like uh, self, whether uh, self is uh, located somewhere in the brain, because we are starting with the brain and neuronal activity. And uh, up till now, the findings of neuroscience is that, no, it's not really possible to find any neuronal circuit or any locations where you can say that well, consciousness is located in this space. We say this is a distributive property. And uh, I can give you a very simple example. Like in the very primitive stage, you know the bacteria, if you take the individual bacteria, they don't respond to the environment or the, don't respond to other bacteria. But now if you put a several bacteria in a particular volume, and if you increase the number density, then at a certain stage, the bacteria like to started to talk each other. So we say that kind of awareness arises because when there are a certain number of bacteria and not at the individual level. And this question comes again in case of neuronal activity. Many people say that even each neuron has qualia or as consciousness. But uh, like I am saying, like the collection of bacteria, we need a kind of global area or global cortical areas for many, many neurons together so that what we get the subjective experience or consciousness. So even that, even that if a neuron had, a neuron is conscious, but it will not be manifested throughout the brain. It has, need, needs certain number of neurons. And self-awareness, I mean, uh, exactly if we can understand self in this way, then the whole problem of self-awareness and self uh, reflexivity can be explained uh, and I have a comment on that because uh, I don't know how we can relate with the Buddhist paradigm say uh, when we say in, in the uh, modern neuroscientific experiment uh, it is shown that uh, brain is considered to be self-referential systems it is found from experiments as well as modeling, theoretical modeling of neuroscience. So if a system like brain is self-referential, then whether we can attribute the self, our self-reflexivity to this kind of system. It is not from a single neuron, but again, it's many, many neurons, and uh, it is distributed over a big region. So I, I, I may ask my Buddhist colleague to say if the system itself is self-referential, then whether we can relate with self-reflexivity uh, with that kind of systems automatically. Okay, I, I'll be finished. Okay. And then comes intentionality. Uh, you know, according to uh, modern School of Neuroscience, one of the major proposal is that uh, motricity or the movement of the entity or object is related to consciousness. So, uh, is it possible that an entity which doesn't have the capability of movement, like a plant, according to this proposal, they don't have consciousness? So my Buddhist colleague, may, he, he may enlighten us whether the plants have consciousness or it is according to modern neuroscience. So maybe these are my small comments and, uh, and maybe last one, I just forget it. Uh, the term memory you used, this is very important for us because in science, maybe there is a problem of uh, translation of the word city and memory. Uh, if we understand correctly memory in modern science that by learning something can be gained and uh, 
that is called as a memory and there is a concept called a prior notions. So if uh, Buddhahood is like a memory, then is there any process to unlearn it? Because if, if you take a computer, you can have a memory, but you can delete also the memory. So maybe the word memory may not be suitable for this kind of context. Thank you, Professor Roy. <coughs> Professor Jimpa? Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Cicero Roy, um, for your comments. Um, and um, also, you know, underlining the fact that for the neuroscientist, um, at this point, the main focus of their study of consciousness really has been on tackling the problem of qualia, the subjective experience. And um, you're also right that if neuroscience finds a natural language to really capture that, you know, character of consciousness, then it would have gone quite a long way to solve what is called the hard problem of consciousness. Um, so that, in that, yeah. I, I, I agree. But the problem is, it's one thing to say, and this is where the explanatory gap becomes an issue. It's one thing to say we can attribute conscious processes to an organism when there is X amount of neuronal activity. That I can imagine at some point neuroscience may be able to get there. So that's the neural correlate. Yeah. This is what um, um, uh, you know, um, Christoph Koch is particularly interested in. But for me, that is just a correlation. It is just a correlation. It still leaves the explanatory gap. It does give us some understanding of how, you know, what amount of neuronal activity would support conscious experience, but that doesn't really explain what conscious experience is. And it doesn't help any, it doesn't enrich the concept of science itself in articulating, um, because I, the way I see this is, I see at this point, neuroscience is trying to describe our mental life. That is a fact. But it is describing by using the language of the brain. And the language of the brain is, by its very nature, a language from outside of facts that are occurring. In philosophy of mind, and particularly the Indian tradition, what I see is it's a language of the mind. It is a language from the perspective of the person who is living in that experience of con consciousness. And I can't quite say at this point, given the conceptual resources that are available for neuroscience, that how can that experimentary gap be ever bridged through, even through this, you know, quest, neurocorrelated kind of quest. That's my own observation. Um, and the, the, the question you raised about systems being self-referential, that is a very interesting question. Um, because if that is true, I mean, first of all, I'm not quite clear what it means to be self-referential in this kind of material, you know, physiological organism. Well, we, we have a particular definition of self-referentiality in uh, system science itself. Okay. So if, if that is the case, then one could imagine that the I suggested two forms of reflexivity thesis. One is a stronger one, yeah. which Professor Garfield particularly is a great critique, and which Dignaga, and I'm kind of, I have to admit, despite all my exposure to Madhyamaga, I'm kind of personally quite attracted to that view. But there is a moderate version of, one could say, reflexivity, which is the, the general capacity of the mind to reflect upon itself, which is a second order. Yeah. But, um, so if in the physical domain one can talk about systems level self-reference, yeah. then one could find a way of talking about reflexivity in this yeah. moderate version. Yeah. That seems to be, although I'm not quite sure what the self-referential system is in the physical, in the material sense. Um, and the final question about plants, 
That's a very interesting question because that's an ancient question. The question that uh, has been debated with the Jains and the Buddhists for a long, long, long time, um, whether the plants are conscious. And Buddhists generally tend to say no. And the, some Indian philosophy, particularly Jains, will say yes. And so in the Buddhist conceptualization, you have kind of a inorganic matter, then you have organic living forms, then you have the sentient forms. So these seem to be three, you know, if you're using the kind of evolutionary kind of framework. Um, so which would, and then the sentient is really described in terms of capacity uh, of some capacity of experience, pain and pleasure actually, the sentient is defined in terms of the capacity for pain and pleasure. Now, to argue that the plants don't have pain and pleasure is a difficult one, because you can't you know, imagine, but generally the Buddhist position would be the plants and sentient beings are different, because sentient need to have this capacity for pain and pleasure. So we say that uh, mortality is not there. Yes, good. yeah, yeah. That, that is a good, good uh, you know, uh, yeah. addition. And the last one is memory. Yeah. We're going to open things to questions, and we've already got a few hands up. Regarding the issue whether uh, plants have consciousness or not, uh, the Advaita Vedantin should definitely say that plants have consciousness because consciousness pervades everywhere, but everything doesn't have the same capacity to manifest or reveal consciousness. The table also, here also is consciousness, but the table can't uh, manifest consciousness as my body or my mind can. Actually, when we talk about consciousness, it is a, it should be differentiated from Brahman's consciousness. Because in that case, there will be no difference between a table and a human being and a, a tree, a, animals, etc. So, when we are talking about consciousness of uh, trees, uh, it is something different. And Udayanachari in 10th century, a great Nayayaga, tells us that these are also having, these are conscious, these are having consciousness. Why? Because if you cut a tree, there is, this is uh, getting cured. And this is the form of pranavayu. Due to pranavayu, this is getting cured. So these, these are uh, also conscious according to Nyaya philosophy. And modern, modern neuroscience says that if they don't have neuron and nervous system, yeah. they can't have consciousness. Yeah. This is the present understanding of I may just add one point. Uh, just as consciousness is everywhere, consciousness gets, on the point of view, gets revealed through everything. Even the tree has the power to reveal consciousness to a uh, very great extent because it also breathes, it also um, uh, just absorbs, it has life, it grows, it dies. Uh, so uh, it manifests, uh, it, uh, even there are trees uh, which contacts when someone touches it such as the Lajavati Lata, etc. So there are uh, various features of sentient organisms which are manifested even by plants. So we have a, plants also can reveal consciousness, but at a lower level. Yeah, and we have a question from the floor, so I'm going to, to recognize that person. Thank you. Um, I have a question that's generally directed at uh, Professor Pitbull and Dr. Uh, Jinpa. Uh, Professor, you mentioned just previously in the last uh, section that there's no barrier between uh, subject and object, and previously in the um, panel last night, you mentioned the possibility of reality being the observer, and I'm just sort of connecting that to um, this paper and how it was mentioned that um, consciousness is reflexively aware um, and that because of that, each subsequent recollection adds a single aspect. Um, what exactly does that uh, have an implication for, for both science and philosophy? Thank you very much. There are two, two sides uh, in your question, but I will answer at least the first side. 
it's about so the the idea of uh, lack of barrier between uh, subject and object, uh, and it raises the question, as you say, of, of what is reality after all? Is it some object out there? Is it a big object called the, the cosmos? Or is it what we find when we open the eyes? Namely, not object and subject, but object for a subject. Or a consciousness of something with intentionality, as, um, as uh, Jim Pa said. So, from that starting point, from that obvious immediate st starting point, then we, try, we, we may ask, how is it so that we believe in the duality of object and subject? And then all, you know, phenomenology it has this philosophical discipline I was uh, describing yesterday. All phenomenology has had as, a, you know, a purpose to understand how possibly we can uh, elaborate the notion of an object that is independent of us out of this non-dual experience. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, the point I was trying to make, of course, I was using um, Dignard as a kind of an example, because sometimes there is a tendency, because where the discourse is taking place in English, and we use terms like subjectivity, which is right now a hot topic in neuroscience, and we use terms like intentionality, which comes from kind of, you know, phenomenology and um, retano, um, that we forget that these are features of cognition and consciousness that Indian philosophers have thought about. And the, the quote from the Dharmakirti really captures what we mean by intentionality, which is the content aspect of consciousness. Um, and subjectivity is the, the zinam uh, aspect. So, so these, and, and what I find interesting is that these ideas coming from two completely different disciplines, one from the East, very old, and one from the West, quite contemporary. And generally, maybe I'm naive, and I'm kind of a universalist at heart, so when I see similar ideas coming from two different directions, my tendency is that it is converging on something that is we need to take seriously. If not true, we need to take it seriously. So that was one of the reasons that I brought this up. Reflexivity is a harder issue. And I'm personally quite attracted to this because um, I find the, the argument that if consciousness is not self-luminous, it won't be able to illuminate objects. Um, just like light, you know, light is self-luminous, therefore it can illuminate other objects. Um, so, and also we intuitively know um, when we remember experiencing something, we also remember not just the object that we experience, but also we remember how we experienced it. So there is a kind of a, a feeling tone that comes with our memory, a recollection, all of which are, has to do with subjective experience. So now whether we take reflexivity, the strong thesis, and you, can, you saw that His Holiness was actually taking me to task for taking that too seriously. <laughs> Um, and you know, and he's he's right. There is a danger that when you postulate something like reflexivity, the strong of his is that it really tantamounts to postulating something that has an intrinsic existence, which is a big problem for Madhyamaka philosophers. But on the other hand, my own sense is that there might be a middle way where we don't need to go all the way to Tignaga and Chandrakshita land, which is a very strong thesis of self-illumination, so that every episode of color consciousness or cognition is self-illuminating. We may not go that direction. But on the other hand, it's not simply a higher order subsequent cognition, which Kumari Navada you know, talks about and Chandideva talks about which doesn't seem to capture this reflexivity in a strong way. 
So my own feeling is that there might be something in between. So whatever that may be, the point I'm trying to make is that if we take these features of consciousness seriously, it does raise serious questions for both Western philosophy of mind, which, you know, Western philosophy of mind, particularly the Anglo-American kind, has been very dominated by scientific thinking. It's very objectivist. And, you know, the subjective experience qualia discussion has come partly because of neuroscience <laughs> trying to get into the, you know, game. Um, so I think, you know, it is by looking at these ideas from an Indian perspective, it opens up a new way of thinking about the phenomenon that both Western philosophy and science are interested in, as well as the Indian uh, classical traditions as well. That was the main point I was trying to make. Any other questions from the floor before I turn back here? Questions from the floor? Come to the microphone, please. This question is meant for anyone on the dais who can answer this. It has to, it has to do with the incommensurability of worldviews. On one side you have the science, and on the other side you have, I don't want to use the word religion, but you have Eastern, uh, Eastern Indian, Indo-Tibetan, um, and also Sri Lankan uh, Buddhist traditions. How do you uh, bring these two worlds together, or is it incommensurable? And the discussions we've had yesterday and today has been this chaos, cacophony of language and problem of translation. So, from both views, uh, from both sides, how do you how do you bring this together, or can you bring this together? Who would like to speak first on this? Because I think everybody on this stage has something to say. You would like to speak first? You want me to speak first? I'll speak first. <clears throat> I don't think there's a problem. I do think, as you saw, there is a cacophony. There's a, there are debates about translation. Those are good debates. But we have debates about translation within traditions, too. Trans tr the indeterminacy of translation, as Quan said, begins right at home. Um, we have disagreements, but we have disagreements within traditions, too. We have agreements, and we have agreements within traditions as well. Um, I honestly think that when we look at the history of philosophy across the world, whether we're looking at the Indian tradition, the Tibetan tradition, the Chinese tradition, Native American traditions, African traditions, pick your tradition. We find the same broad questions being asked. We find answers that are different enough to make conversation worthwhile, close enough to make conversation possible. If we disagree too much, we have nothing to talk about. If we agree too much, the conversation is really boring. Frequently, for, fortunately, when we do cross-cultural philosophy, my experience is the conversation is never boring and it's almost always productive. And I think that's because we do have a great deal to learn from one another. That's my first thought. Um, so about this question, I think it's really important because it's exactly where we are. And uh, we are trying to do that. But, you know, in the dialogue between science, religions, or traditions, there are two pitfalls to be avoided. Yeah. The first one is pure conflict. Uh, and it was the case, you know, in the time of Galileo, or even Giordano Bruno, uh, which religion felt attacked by science. It felt hostile to science. So this is the conflict. The other pitfall is uh, um, rapid analogy, two quick analogies, and saying, oh, this is all the same because it resembles, it has similar uh, ideas, but it's very vague. We don't know exactly. We, in order to uh, do a good dialogue between uh, science and traditions and, and tradition of thought, we have to, to posit exactly what are the differences what are the standpoints? For instance, um, it's true that science and Buddhism has, have a point in common. It is empiricism. Namely, uh, you know, it's, you, the inquiry is based on experience. But uh, empiricism is quite different in both ca cases. 
In Buddhism, the empiricism comes from direct experience. In science, empiricism is about experiments, namely things that you arrange in the laboratory in order to circumscribe the range of variation of what you are studying. So these are different empiricisms. And therefore, when you understand these differences, the dialogue becomes possible. One case where the dialogue was obviously very well and carefully thought through was with uh, Francisco Varela's neurophenomenology. He accepted that the two disciplines had very different outlooks, and yet they can collaborate. They can go in the same direction from two different points of view. And the two together give new results. This is a, a remarkable feature. Now I can add on uh, more thing. Even without going into uh, science and uh, Indian philosophical tradition, even within remaining within the science, if somebody works in biology and he's yeah. taking some methodology or some concepts from physics, then there is also a problem. Because uh, uh, I'm going to tell the, uh, these things in case of the next speakers, uh, Sion Raman. Yeah, okay, like uh, when you are using phase transitions, phase transition well known in physics. But if you try to understand phase transition brain function, this is altogether, uh, you know. I'd like to thank everybody on the dais now. It's my turn to walk away. And uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Santen.